Hello friends! Welcome back to another episode of Reddit Nuclear Revenge. In this episode, there's gonna be three stories, with the last one actually making it to the news and being a real story despite sounding insane. You'll hear about fed up boyfriends, deadbeat dads, and a bulldozer wreaking havoc on a town. I hope you stay for these stories today and subscribe for future videos. This one's titled, Taking Down the Person That Caused So Much Pain. This isn't my story, but rather my father's revenge on my mom's dad. My parents were born in a rural part of Mexico, in a small town. An important thing to note is that the area they lived in had a problem with scorpions, and the nearest hospital wasn't for a few hours. Life wasn't exactly easy for them. My mom didn't get far in school, having been taken out of the 6th grade, while my dad didn't finish 4th grade of elementary school. My mom grew up with a strict set of parents, and her dad was prone to violent outbursts, while her mom emotionally cut her down and sometimes got physical with her. My parents met one night when they were about 15 years old, and from what my mom said, they hit it off right away. Nothing romantic, but they quickly became great friends. My dad's mom came to view her as somewhat of a daughter, and would have taken her whenever she had the chance. My dad was never invited to her house, however. For the next two years, life for my mom was still really difficult, especially since her father started drinking more frequently and her mother became even more distant. There were times when my dad saw something was wrong simply because of how she walked and how she started to wince in pain from the tiniest touch. Pretty soon they officially started dating. One day, my mom's mother simply disappeared with no explanation. This caused her dad to become even more physically violent. She endured all of this because, try as she might, she simply couldn't leave him. When she was 18 years old, she discovered she was pregnant with me. When she told her dad, you can only imagine what he did to her. He called her names, cut her down, telling her she was no good to him anymore, and she endured a beating. She knew she had to get out before anything worse happened. She ran to my dad's house where she explained everything to him, and how her life had been a total hell for such a long time, and how she was pregnant. He knew right then and there that he had to do something about it to get revenge for everything she endured in the past. He knew simply turning him in wouldn't be enough. He had to make sure he was taken care of for good. My dad knew many people who worked at Scorpion Pest Control, so he contacted them and asked which ones would be the most dangerous and lethal. Since the area we lived in was filled with scorpions, he went looking and found a few with the highest chance of producing a fatal sting. The following day, he was able to sneak into my mom's house and put the scorpions underneath the dad's bed covers and went home. The following day, when my mom went to his house, she found him laying lifeless in his bed. She was horrified and shocked and my dad pretended to be shocked too. They got married soon after I was born. He kept this secret for many years and when he finally told her, she was both upset and happy. That one night changed both of their lives. I think OP's dad went a little too far in this story, but then again, I've been fortunate enough to not have to live through a horrendous situation such as this. Yeah, let's get rid of your dad from this equation because he treated you badly for so many years. And also, I can't imagine the mom reacting to him after he tells her that he was the reason that her dad died. Um, you know how your dad died that one day from that scorpion? Well shit, that was all me. What a crazy story. This one's titled, You Were Never My Dad. Back in the mid 90s, my sister got knocked up by a guy. She was 17 and he was 18. I despised the guy with pretty much every fiber of my being. My mom decided, however, that a baby should know their father. So she invited him to come live in our house without telling me. It took me a week to calm down enough so that when I eventually came back, I didn't punch him when I walked through the door. John was a piece of shit. Great artistic talent, but all he did all day was sit in the garage and do prison tats for people. In addition to stealing mine and my deceased father's power tools and pawning them for a few bucks so he could get some cigarettes. I worked a full time job and went to school, so I would be gone 12 to 14 hours a day. But it felt like I was pulling into the driveway of a frat house with a dozen or so people drinking and hanging out in the garage until they had to leave in the morning. I slowly curtailed that shit by being a giant pain in the ass to all the guests, by having their cars towed or their wheels inexplicably slashed. By the time my nephew was two, I'd managed to put a stop to the 24 hour party zone, but people would still congregate on Saturdays. A few months later, I'd had enough and threw John to the curb. 
My sister's friends all came forward to tell her how he'd try to make advances on them and hit on them all the time, all the while professing his devotion to my sister and their child. I'd thrown him out and John disappeared for 8 years, no idea where and I didn't really care. Then out of nowhere, we got a court summons for a custody hearing. John was suing for custody. However, in the 8 years since he disappeared, my sister had met a guy and they'd gotten married. My nephew was formally adopted by a stepdad and changed his legal name. The first hearing was dismissed because the allegations made as the basis for a custody hearing were investigated by CPS and decided as to having no substance in fact. The nephew wasn't beaten or neglected, the house wasn't a disaster and in danger of falling apart. Every few months, John would file another custody hearing request until it finally got a date. John made a number of allegations, all of which were disproven by documentation and fact. Finally, the judge decided that he'd had enough and called my 10 year old nephew up and asked him who he wanted to live with. My nephew responded, I don't know him, he walked out of my life when I was 2, he's not my dad, stepdad is my dad, and he, John, will never be my dad and I don't ever want to see him again. The judge ruled against John and dismissed his custody request with prejudice. When I looked at John, he was sobbing in his chair as his mother comforted him. I sneered at him and flipped him off as I walked out of the courtroom. As to why John was missing for 8 years, apparently he'd been committed to a mental facility in Tennessee and when he got out years later, he was on SSI disability and then plotted various ways to hurt me, my sister and my mom once he got out. The custody hearing was meant to be the culminating event, but fortunately John was an idiot and we had enough money to hire a good attorney. A few years later, John tried to mend some fences with my nephew and invited him to come down to where he lived and meet his relatives, including a half-brother my nephew didn't even know he had. This is in addition to the half-brother and sister he has from his mom and adoptive father. When my nephew was 15, almost 16, we received a call that John was dead. Someone had blown his brains out as he sat on the couch in his mobile home. I felt sorry for John's girlfriend and her son, but for John, I didn't feel a thing. A journalist tracked my nephew down a few months later and filled us in on some details. Apparently, John had been targeted as a result of moving into someone else's territory to distribute drugs. The would-be kingpin paid a guy a few hundred bucks and the promise of an ATV to get rid of him. Typical redneck retribution, I guess. The journalist asked my nephew for a quote, and he said, Sure. I wish I could meet the man who did this to him. Why's that? The journalist asked. So I could shake his hand. John was never my dad, and I won't miss him. That's one savage kid. This story's titled, Marvin's Killdozer. Sometime in the early 2000s, there was a small town in Colorado. Amongst the residents in Granby, there was a muffler repair shop owner named Marvin Hemeyer. He was sort of a cool guy. I don't know how to describe him. He also got along with some people. One day, the company was going to make a concrete plant right next to his shop. Marvin was against the idea, but he was alone. The construction of the plant would cut off only the entrance to the shop. Marvin tried to get people to sign a petition, but he couldn't get enough people to sign. Marvin decided that he was going to make his own entrance to the shop and bought everything he needed to do so, and the city denied his request to build a new road. Eventually, the concrete plant cut off Marvin's sewage and the city fined Marvin for it. This was the last straw. Marvin started constructing a tank out of the materials he got to build a new road to his shop. One of the items was a bulldozer. He recorded himself often and eventually finished the killdozer. Despite its name, it didn't harm anyone. He designed it that when the armor was lifted onto the bulldozer, it's not coming off. Marvin got into the bulldozer and lifted the armor onto it. Marvin drove the killdozer through his shop and into the concrete plant. He goes to the city and destroys buildings of those who wronged him, such as the newspaper plant that lied about Marvin, the former mayor's house and the town hall. He destroyed many more buildings. The governor of Colorado even considered destroying the killdozer with hellfire missiles. That idea was scrapped for obvious reasons. When Marvin was destroying a shop, the radiator was leaking and the bulldozer broke down. Marvin then shot himself. At first, when I was reading this story, I thought for sure this was some crazy story that was made up, but everything in this story actually happened. Also, as I was scrolling through the comments, it turns out that Marvin may not have been a good guy in this situation. 
here's one of the comments from the post. This guy says, No, Marvin was actually an asshole. He was a paranoid guy who thought the government was out to get him, and that he was on a mission from God. He bought his land for $42,000 in 1992, and was later offered $250,000 for it, which he initially agreed with before backing out and demanding $1 million for it. So it's not like he was being screwed over, he just wanted confrontation. And while the killdozer didn't harm anyone, it wasn't for lack of trying. Most of the buildings he destroyed were occupied moments before destroying them, including the town library which wasn't listed in the story, which was hosting a children's program at the time it was destroyed. The former mayor's house he destroyed? That mayor died three years prior, and only his widow lived there now. The newspaper that lied about him? Wrong. They had even published all letters of his protest. It's not their fault that he didn't win over anyone's opinion. From gun ports, he fired at state troopers who hadn't taken action against him. He also fired on propane tanks that had they ignited, would have also destroyed a senior citizen's complex nearby. I hope you guys enjoyed today's episode of Reddit Nuclear Revenge. Let me know if you thought these stories are worthy of the Nuclear Revenge badge or not, and let me know your opinions on the stories in the comment section below. If you aren't subscribed, hit that subscribe button so you don't miss future videos. See you guys in the next one.